Okay, so before we do our quick video sweep from Solomon through to the fall of Samaria in uh, 722 BC, just going to read um, a couple of sections from Deuteronomy, which give us a bit of key background into understanding where the Israelites went wrong. Okay, firstly, Deuteronomy 12 and verse 13 and 14 it says, take care that you do not offer your burnt offerings at any place you happen to see, but only at the place that the Lord will choose in one of your tribes. There you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do everything I command you. Second bit I just want to read quickly is um, from Deuteronomy 17 and verses 14 to 20. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and have taken possession of it, and settled in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, then you may indeed set over you a king, whom the Lord your God will choose. One of your own community you may set as king over you. You are not permitted to put a foreigner over you who is not of your own community. Even so... He must not acquire many horses for himself or return to the people of Egypt in order to acquire more horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you must never return that way again. And he must not acquire many wives for himself or else his heart will turn away. Also, silver and gold he must not acquire in great quantity for himself. When he has taken the throne of his kingdom, he shall have a copy of this law written for him in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall remain with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life, so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, diligently observing all the words of this law and these statutes, neither exalting himself above other members of the community, nor turning aside from the commandment, either to the right or to the left, so that he and his descendants may reign long, over his kingdom in Israel. Okay, so as we turn then to Solomon, we see, first of all, that there are some really good things about him. So in 1 Kings 3, verse 3, he's described as someone who loved God um, and walked in the statutes of his father, David. Then in 3, verse 9, we see when given the opportunity, he asks God for wisdom rather than riches. In chapter 4.20, we see that he brings peace and prosperity to Israel. It says, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea. They ate and drank and were happy. And then in verse 25, during Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel lived in safety, from Dan even to Bathsheba, all of them under the vines and their fig trees. Then in chapters 5 and 6, we see that he builds a magnificent temple. In chapter 8, he dedicates the temple to God and makes a brilliant prayer. And then in chapter 9, we see God appears again to Solomon and does a kind of reiteration of the covenant that he made to David that we looked at last time. However, this time there is the if. God says to Solomon... I have heard your prayer and your plea which you made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built and put my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. As for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my ordinances, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever as I promised your father David. In uh, chapter 10, there is the visit from the Queen of Sheba, and she's amazed at Solomon's wisdom and all that he's acquired. And so there are lots of good things about Solomon. However, also in these chapters, there are some hints that things aren't quite as well as they seem. And so again, going back to 1 Kings in chapter 3 we see in verse 1 Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh king of Egypt he took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her 
into the city of David. Then in chapter 3, verse 4, it says that he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. Then in chapter 4, verse 26, Solomon also had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And then in 9, verse 28, we see that he acquired lots of gold. These hints that things aren't quite as good as they seem then come to the fore in chapter 11, where we read, King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the Israelites, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for they will surely incline your heart to follow their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Among his wives were 700 princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not true to the Lord his God and as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon followed Astarte, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did, that, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not completely follow the Lord as his father David had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. He did the same for all his foreign wives, who offered incense and sacrifice to their gods. Then the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, and had commanded him concerning this matter, that he should not follow other gods. But he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your mind, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of your father David I will not do it in your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. I will not, however, tear away the entire kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son, for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. The kingdom then divides, as the prophet Ahijah had foreseen. The division is brought about because Rehoboam, Solomon's son, listens to the advice of his contemporaries, rather than that of the older men who had advised his father. He foolishly tells the northern tribes that he will become a harsher ruler than Solomon had been, at which point, under the leadership of Jeroboam, the northern tribes rebel and the kingdom splits in two. Although from a biblical point of view, Judah seems the more important of the two new kingdoms, with the vast majority of prophetic books directed at her, it was Israel who, in her day, was the more powerful and prosperous. Further, Israel's location was better, better suited than Judah's for trade with other nations. However, this advantage had a serious downside in that Israel was also more vulnerable to attacks from these nations. This inherent vulnerability contributed to Israel's destruction just 200 years later. However, from a biblical perspective, there was another factor at work which was far more devastating than Israel's location was that her rebellion from God, a rebellion that took root right at the start. <laughs>